A very good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining Stronger Together, a webinar on gender-based violence and suicide prevention. Today we have a very experienced panel, some of them familiar faces, who will be joining with us today to discuss this matter of utmost importance. So um, deviating from our standard, we are going to start with a music video. So this is actually Ashanti's newest music video, Rajiniye. So I hope you enjoy the small video we have. And that was Rajinie Ashanti's newest uh, music video. As you can see, it's tackling quite a broad topic 
and something that is very much needed. So uh, special thanks go to the British Council Sri Lanka's Voices and Choices Grant, which funded this music video. So today we are discussing uh, gender-based violence and also suicide prevention with our esteemed panel consisting of Sharanya Sekaram, Adli Muhammad, and of course, Ashanti Dialvis. Our moderator today will be Shanuki, who is a familiar face from many of our previous webinars. So Shanuki is a brand purpose consultant, uh, skills development coach, speaker, talk show host, and an advocate. So without further ado, I'll just hand over the controls to Shanuki and we can get this webinar started. Um, as Parami said, um, I enjoy speaking and these are two causes that I am very passionate about. And um, I'm so happy that we have a panel like this to speak to you about it because it's not the nicest of subjects to talk about, but it is uh, both subjects are two of the most important subjects that we need to talk about as a society. Um, just to give you a little bit more of an introduction uh, to the panel today. So we have the creator of the music video that you just watched, Ashanti Dialvis. Uh, we all know who she is. She needs no introduction. A singer, a songwriter, a producer. Uh, she's the judge uh, on, on The Voice. And you know, she's been doing amazing things using her art uh, to create movements with her fan base and with, with the youth of Sri Lanka. And she's also been taking the youth uh, a long way when it comes to recognizing talent. Uh, then we have Sharanya, uh, Sharanya Sekram, who you know uh, should not be messed with, uh, and uh, is is kind of uh, one of uh, one of those ladies who's spearheading uh, the way for Sri Lanka, where women should generally not be messed with in the future if Sharanya has her way. Uh, so Sharanya is a feminist writer. She's a researcher and activist. Activist. Uh, she's a program manager. Uh, she works uh, for the Grassrooted Trust and uh, she's also behind the wonderful informative educational work that happens with Bakamuna. Um, Bakamuna.lk. And then we have Adle Mohammed. Adle, uh, I don't know if you've been on Instagram and you've seen her page, Emotional Wellbeing with Adle. Adle is kicking ass in making people feel good uh, about themselves and taking on their problems. Uh, she's a counselor and she's the assistant center manager for Shanti Magam. Uh, she's a trainer, a facilitator, and she's a mental health advocate. So thank you ladies for being on this panel. Okay, we're going to talk about two subjects today. They are really, really vast subjects. Uh, so we're going to try and talk about what is most important for you and I to know. Um, there is a lot more, of course, and after this panel discussion, I would encourage all of you, if you are interested in learning more and getting more involved in activism and advocacy, do read up, do go to the several resources available and find out as much as you can about what's happening in the country around these topics. But let's start off with the music video, the subject of the music video, which was sexual harassment or gender-based violence. And I'm gonna start off with the creator of the video, Ashanti. Um, why did you make this particular video? I mean, music videos in general, you know, to get the popular vote and to get your fan following going and to get the ratings up, it's usually all about fun and love and romance and all that. Why did you choose this particular subject for your music video? Well, I mean, I've always wanted to champion the causes uh, for girls and women and give them a voice through my music. Uh, I've come a long way in the commercial music industry and then at one point you think, how do you add value to society? Uh, so for me, it was a turning point in my career as well and uh, growing up in music, I suppose, uh, to take a step back and look at uh, the things that affect people and communities. And uh, there were two things that really uh, got my attention. One was gender-based violence. The other one was suicide prevention and depression. Um, so more specific to gender-based violence, I really thought that I should use music as a medium to open a conversation, to create awareness, and then also, uh, you know, the actions for it and provide the solutions too. So uh, I think art is a great medium to do that. And uh, that's why I got on it. Okay. 
And was it easy to produce a music video like this? I mean, uh, how did you get the funding to do something like this? Because uh, I have a talk show, but it's not easy to get anyone to sponsor or fund a talk show that talks about controversial issues. And this is certainly a controversial issue. Of course. Uh, so who helped you create this? Um, British Council came on board for both music videos, actually. Uh, their Voices and Choices grant was something I had to bid for. So I had to prove that these were two subjects that uh, really uh, affected our youth uh, and our girls and women and mm -hmm. something that I wanted to champion. So I had to bid for this and then basically uh, they selected it as one of the causes they want to support and uh, they put the funds behind the two projects. So uh, I think even the reason we're having this conversation is because we have the two music videos and uh, people can now have more awareness uh, through the music videos on uh, a grass rooted or a mass market scale as well. Yeah, I think uh, it's an important point to note because a lot of activists, advocates, artists, uh, we have a voice and every, people are trying to sort of speak about this, but of course, without that kind of funding or without the endorsement of the corporates or the private sector that, you know, it's, it's the voice is smaller. and. Obviously, uh, support like this can go a long way in reaching more people. But just to I talk specifically... One more thing, sorry. Yeah, sure. When I first put the music video for Hitadane Mitranne out, uh, I called the TV stations, the mainstream media. And they were like, suicide prevention, depression? No, I don't think we can, uh, we can uh, promote anything like that on TV, on mainstream media. So I thought, um, you know what? We don't need the support of mainstream media because we have YouTube. And with yeah. the gender-based violence song, I didn't even go to mainstream media. I think we've come to a point where we can uh, promote our own music. I am promoting the song uh, by myself through uh, TuneCo uh, across all the digital platforms, uh, promoting across uh, YouTube and uh, all social media channels, uh, which is why we're having this conversation on a social media channel as well, uh, platform as well. Even though uh, there is, um, I think, uh, more things that could have been done if the pandemic wasn't happening, because we were supposed to take it to uh, all schools across the island and, you know, just create awareness mm -hmm. about these two subjects with kids. But I think uh, for some reason, we now have a bigger platform. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it's doing its work. And I think there's a reason for everything. Um, Sharanya, I'm just going to move the conversation to you because the music video we watched, Rajini, uh, kind of highlighted certain forms of gender-based violence. So you had the sexual harassment in the workplace. I think a lot of a lot of women in Sri Lanka, if they watch those music videos, it's nothing new, right? This is something that they have experienced in their lifetime at some point or the other. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, harassment based sort of you know, harassment, sexual harassment on public transport uh, was featured in that video. And I think that's something that we still as a society, except for this, you know, handful of people who are working in the field itself. Uh, there's a large ignorance around this subject of gender based violence because it's a huge, huge subject, right? And it's got like very it's it that's a broad definition isn't it and gender-based violence really has different forms doesn't it like what what is it that we need to know what is gender-based violence and what are the forms of gender-based violence out there that are predominantly in sri lanka sure uh thanks shaniki uh before i go into that i just also want to come in Aranti, for what was a really beautiful production um, working in this space, I think we see these subjects aren't often handled with the sensitivity and with the dignity of the of the people who are going through this, right? It's often sensationalized. You see clothes ripping. You see this very sort of like um, uh, clickbaity type uh, creations. And just, I really want to commend you um, just for what a beautiful, sensitive, dignified portrayal, but that didn't compromise how painful and how just torturous this this kind of um, harassment is so just really I mean I was really blown away with how phenomenal um, what a phenomenal piece of work that is I, I just wanted to say that um, while it's at the top of my head. Um, Shani, to answer your question gender-based violence is essentially a large term which was developed around um, the late 80s early 90s um, by feminist activists to understand violence that is linked to gender inequality. 
So often gender-based violence is said to be violence that happens due to gender, which is actually a slight incorrection. It's not really the correct definition of the term, right? Because what gender-based, the term gender-based violence tries to do is distinguish from other forms of violence, like war, normal homicide or murder, normal, or like, you know, fits of rage, um, a fight that might happen in a bar. It seeks to make a distinction between those forms of everyday violence and violence that is specifically linked to uh, gender inequality in society. So it is a violence that uh, has its roots in how we view men and women, how women and men have been socialized to think about themselves, to think about their relationships with each other, to think about their roles and their place within society. And the violence that results directly from those who violate that or because of the power dynamics that result from this kind of divisions in society. So, for example, violence against women or sexual harassment in public transport has its links to the idea that women shouldn't occupy public space. That by occupying public space, by being in the public, by being alone, um, by traveling, by engaging in, in the public domain, which is seen to be the male's domain, they are inviting violence in, that, that is, it is all right, or it, that they are asking for it. Similarly, you see uh, another form of gender-based violence which you brought up, which is workplace sexual harassment, is again this idea that women's role in, in the formal workplace is limited, right? Um, I think we can no longer say that we still think the women's role is in the home. I think it's evolved slightly to the point where we think women should be in the workplace, but in certain capacities. She should yeah. be the receptionist and the pretty secretary. She needs to take on emotional labor. Um, you know, if, if uh, when we do workplace sexual harassment um, seminars and the work I've done in that, it's really interesting to hear from the women where they said always expected to be the ones with the stapler and the pen and the Panadol to like help. They're the ones who are expected to de-escalate conflicts in office. So you hear this narrative, right? Put a woman on the team because she'll manage things better. It's good to have a woman on the team. She's often expected the one expected to be the one to sort of collect the money for a card or uh, the wreath of flowers for somebody whose relative has passed away. This emotional labor, right? So and then when women are violating that idea of who they should be, even within the workplace, they're inviting the harassment. And by being in the workplace, their role is to be pretty, to provide that uh, attractiveness, to soften things. You know, you often see corporates will have a lovely picture and they'll put, you know, three of their best looking women to show that we're soft and we're gentle and we're lovely. And so that's where really what gender-based violence is. It's violence that is linked to gender inequality in society. And until we solve gender inequality and until we quite literally dismantle the patriarchy, that violence will continue to persevere. Unlike war or homicide or bar fights or regular brawls, which you can solve by you know, other means, gender-based violence is rooted in gender inequality. Okay. And if I were to sort of just ask you, now you, you did mention the patriarchy. Why does the patriarchy even exist? Who started this? And why do a lot of women in Sri Lanka themselves kind of perpetuate it? If you look at, yeah. you know, a lot of these, uh, for instance, even the, the ones who think that all they are worth is that pretty secretary mm -hmm. or that emotional mm -hmm. labor or that they should be, you know, covering themselves up on the bus and all that. Why, what is the root cause for this patriarchy and, you know, what's going on so with society? So patriarchy actually comes from the idea of a patrilinear society, right? So patrilinear okay. societies where uh, money, power and, and lineage is in the hands of males. So male, males would own property and this... So it's interesting to note that not all societies were patrilinear. And we have, because of colonization, we primarily, our societies are also now that because we follow patrilinear societies. So it's where when we stop being, when certain Western societies stopped being nomadic and they started settling in their own land, land became power, money became power. So who owns the land? Who has the lineage to the land, right? And then because back in those days, you didn't have DNA tests, you had it as the males because it was easier to tell who were their lineage lay. So that's, so we, you can't separate power and money from patriarchy. Right. And then patriarchy. So then therefore men had control over money. They had control over public office they, because they quite literally owned the land. And then that bills continues to build over thousands of years, a system that positions one sex over the other in a particular kind of way. Now, the problem there is 
even though other things in society have evolved, the structures and the systems that we have created with this in mind has not evolved. Right. So, so if you take, for example, women voting, it only really started happening 100 years ago. Right. So prior to that, the older, older democracies, the laws, the structures, the systems were created by one sex, maybe not necessarily always with the intention to oppress or dominate the other sex, but with themselves at the, as, as the center, because that was a reality. Right. So this is why a patriarchy, there is no point replacing it with a matriarchy and saying we've solved the problem because that's simply yeah. re replacing one power system with another. It's about dismantling those power systems and questioning why power systems exist. Yeah. So the reason many women buy into or subscribe into the patriarchy is because we're all raised by the same society, right? And nothing keeps a system of inequality and power going greater then those who are oppressed by it, believing that that's the right system. That's the greatest success of the patriarchy, right? It turns its foot, its foot soldiers are those who are most oppressed by it. Because the minute those who are most oppressed by it are like, hold on, this is not working. What do you have? History has shown us you have a revolution. It's what happened in the French Revolution. It's what happened in Russia. It's what happened with independence struggles. You know, it's, you, once you start thinking and looking at it as a system of power and you compare it historically, that's what's happened. And that's what's happening slowly and has been happening at different points in history is revolution brews. Women are like, hold on. What do you mean I can't vote? What do you mean I can't own my own land? Revolution brews, change happens. And now we're very much in the phase of the, I don't know whether you phrase it as the Me Too revolution, but you are in the revolution of, of sexual liberation, of uh, women occupying public space, women's bodies, women's right to exist in the forms that they want to exist in. And that challenges the very notions of how gender-based violence takes place. So yeah. to answer why women subscribe to the patriarchy is because women are raised by the patriarchy, right? It's and all, of it's course all we know. Subscribe to it. It's all you yeah. know. And, and yeah. you are raised to believe that. And also remember the patriarchy rewards you for being a good woman. You are rewarded. So it gives you limited rewards. You will then become the ideal mother. You become the ideal wife. You're the cool girl. You're not like other girls. These are all rewards the patriarchy little by little gives you just enough to make you believe that if you subscribe to the system, you really will be happier than those unmarried, miserable feminists at 40 who all they want is to have sex and have a man to love them. But they can't. Be That's what we've been told, right? Yeah. We're told <laughs> unmarried, <that> miserable <laughs> feminists over here. <laughs> <laughs> but like that, that's constantly what you're being told by the patriarchy. Yeah. So that yeah. fear sets in also. So that's yeah. why women subscribe to it because it's a system and it's a very, very clever system. Yeah. Ajay, I'm just going to put this question on to you now because Sharan is, okay, we, we talked about how women itself, they're conditioned into becoming a part of the system and all that. But then we also have then victims of that system, the women themselves, right? And uh, things like gender-based violence, like this, occasions of sexual harassment, either in the workplace or on public transport, or even in the home or on the street or wherever it is, uh, creates victims, creates, I, I don't want to call them survivors at that point because mm -hmm. they are being victimized, right? Yeah. And this yeah. has uh, a huge effect on people's mental health. We as a society, this culture that we have created, and I say we because all the patriarchy talks about men, we are all part of this society and we are all part of this patriarchy. Um, we are inflicting harm, right, on someone. So what is it actually that women go through? What happens to their mental health when they go through this stuff? Okay. Um, well, as Sharane was saying, like we, we also maintain it, right? So when somebody, uh, let's say they're a victim of gender-based violence, um, there's already so much of stigma surrounding it. Um, and with that uh, comes the shame that's associated. I mean, it's a victim who has gone through all this, but then uh, you, we, what we call victim blaming, right? For example, like Sharon I said, asking for it. So now you, you have to understand already, if it was me, I'm already feeling broken with what has happened. Let's say it was intimate partner violence or something like that. I'm already going through, um, how do you say, the effects of, uh, of going through gender-based violence. And then you, I have to deal with the fact that there's stigma associated with it, right? And even if I, I need to go out for help, then there's come the shame and the guilt that you're made to feel as to, well, that happens. You should be okay with it. And this is a suppression. And for that, it affects somebody's mental health to an extent where if 
they don't get the proper uh, support, let's say from family or friends with what they're going through, it can also lead them to feeling suicidal. Because apart from being a victim, when they don't have support, right? And then they, they have no way to deal with this, then suicide also becomes an option. Um, so, and uh, families also, they have a huge part to play. I know, like we say, it's, it's easy to talk about it saying, yes, this is what we should do. But when somebody actually goes to it, how supportive are women actually? Because a victim blaming doesn't just happen from men. It victim blaming happens from women. And then they're made to feel worse. And uh, if you take people from, let's say, the marginalized community, um, if you take people from the LGBTIQ community, right, they are already stigmatized with being a part of that community. And then when they have been uh, a victim of gender-based violence, um, they, they are at a, a high risk of suicide because they're already going through so much and this is like an added layer. Where do we go to? Whom do we reach out to? So um, it also can lead people uh, to go into depression. So suicide and depression are um, what happens when somebody goes, I mean, not all the time, but those are possibilities of happening depending on how that situation is handled by people around them. Thank you. And uh, so that kind of gives me a good opening to go into our second music video, which is Hitadanne uh, Mituranne. Uh, and uh, which talks about suicide and depression and another segment of community that is susceptible to it, which is the youth. Um, so Harami, if you're there, can we play that music video, please?
Yep, so that was the second music video that we watched, which covers the subject of depression, suicide prevention, stuff that the youth go through, mental health stuff. Uh, Ashanti, why kind of, is there a personal reason that you have chosen these two subjects in particular, gender-based violence and suicide prevention? Do you have any sort of... Well, um, it was first uh, suicide prevention because... Uh, I googled the stats for suicide in Sri Lanka and I was so surprised that I had been completely unaware of this and how how much uh, our youth and uh, I mean even like you know everyone goes through and uh, when I found out what the stats were like uh, reading a WHO report I don't know if that's extremely accurate there is a little bit of controversy here and there with that I've heard uh, but in general the thing that really struck me was that amongst being one of the highest rates in the world or in Asia, that attempted suicide amongst women was the highest. So that really, really got to me. And that's when I thought I would, uh, you know, channel in a British Council for uh, funding for such a project. And um, it sort of went hand in hand really well together because they were trying to champion the cause for women and girls. I wanted to be the voice for it. Uh, so it was a great synergy and we were able to do this with absolutely no uh, interference uh, creatively. So I scripted this music video after having a chat with so many psychologists uh, about the do's and don'ts. Um, I talked to them and got some insight. I think Adle was also there the first time I came into Shanti Margam. I was like vigorously writing notes down on how to do this because I'd never done a music video on such a serious topic before. And I just wanted to be socially conscious about how I produced it. Uh, like Sharanya said, uh, there are a lot of uh, music videos out there that have so much of insensitivity to the subjects. If you're to do justice, and actually look for solutions and give uh, hope to people then it has to be done in uh, a, a proper way so uh, i went through the whole process with psychologists created the scripts based on the most important things that needed to be highlighted and uh, i was told that the things when it comes to uh, teenagers and the problems they face with depression and suicide was parental pressure exam pressure, peer pressure, and also coping with breakups. So those are the things that I've highlighted in this music video. Uh, I know, Shanika, you asked me if there is a personal reason, but uh, there's, it's, not, it's not really personal. It's just that the information that I saw really got to me so much that I thought I need to do something about this. Then it becomes personal. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what do you hope the music videos will do? So you've done the music video. Um, it, do you 
is there any hope that this will go beyond just being a trending subject that people will look at and say, ah, okay, and be aware of, of what, what you hope to do with these music videos? See, it's more difficult to push non-commercial music into the uh, public uh, eye or ear, uh, so to speak, uh, yeah. Yeah. when it comes to these kind of subjects. You will get, uh, uh, I don't know, over millions of views on, on commercial music, but when it comes to these, it will be in the hundred thousands or two hundred thousands. Uh, because of the fact that sometimes people in Sri Lanka just don't want to accept uh, things that they cannot um, speak about. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to turn a blind eye because they feel like living in bliss, uh, I mean ignorance is bliss they say, right? So I feel like if they just turn a blind eye to it, they don't really have to deal with it. But I'm putting it out there, you have to deal with it because you're seeing it. It's right in front of you. You have, the, you can see the things that are happening. It's probably happening to you or someone you know. Uh, and uh, we should be aware of these things that are happening in society. I mean, Sri Lanka as a culture is so closed. I think we need to open up. Uh, we are not the generation uh, of our parents. Uh, we can speak out. Uh, there's so much change because I've been working closely with uh, Gen Z. Uh, and uh, they think so differently, um, even uh, even to how we think. Yeah. I think we are the layer before them. So uh, it, it's really surprising how they think and how they're so open to, to this kind of change. And I've had so many 13, 14 year olds message me about Rajini and say, I love the work that you're doing and that you're championing this cause for us because it's something that uh, really needs to be highlighted and seen. And uh, just the level of, uh, I would say, the growth and the mentality in these small kids that you can see is, is amazing because this is what we need to change a culture. Okay, so then I'm gonna pose the, this next question to both Adley and Sharanya, you can decide who goes first. Uh, but this thing about society being largely blind and ignorant to what's right in front of our faces sometimes, it's because we are not taught or we're, we're conditioned to be blind to it because it's become such a normalcy when it comes to either noticing depression or, or noticing that somebody might be uh, contemplating so is that noticing signs of gender-based violence uh, duress or stress in uh, someone's life um, we don't know what to look for we don't know how to identify it we don't have a language for it um, so could you both take turns in sort of running us through what are the signs? What are the signs that we should be sensitized to, to watch out for, to know that there could be something going on that we can intervene with? And you're both mute. I feel Adli should go first on this one because she okay. is the expert on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I mean, even when I watched this video, uh, when you launched it last time, I was so happy with the video because I know you spoke to us about, you know, and you made sure that, you know, methodology and those things are not portrayed. And it's, it's a video that will connect with people, regardless of age, that will be helpful. And the three instances, uh, I think a lot of uh, youth also will connect to that. Yeah. The instances that you have used, one is, uh, I mean, there's so much of parental pressure to achieve, to pass exams, right? And uh, young children and youth these days are not uh, taught coping mechanisms. They don't know how to cope. They're only told to, okay, this is what you need to achieve and there is no, what if you don't? And uh, bullying also takes place a lot, whether it's in schools, whether it's cyberbullying. So mm, touching on those uh, were really important. And um, I know I sent it to a lot of uh, of my interns at that time also and they were sharing it like mad there's like they didn't know about it and uh, they were sharing it and saying what a wonderful video it was and how it connects to them so i mean hats off to you too for rajini and this because um, i don't know of anybody else who has done videos like this here talking about these kind of topics because um, well suicide or gender-based violence they're both topics that people really don't want to uh, approach because the, the stigma that surrounds it i mean Mental health alone has stigma. So these two, well, there is stigma around it. Um, as for the signs, um, I, I know uh, it's when we know that somebody is feeling suicidal, um, everybody tries to uh, either dismiss or avoid. 
because of fear of it's that huge responsibility that comes in when you know that somebody is suicidal, right? And you don't know what to do. So, um, and some people, uh, I know we had, um, a list, a, it was a listening booth we had uh, for Suicide Prevention Day from Shanti Margam last Saturday. And uh, some of the people, they came and shared stories uh, and they were like, they looked at the warning signs and uh, there was one person who lost a family member and said, I wish I knew this because the person that I lost showed these. So a little bit of awareness goes a long way. Um, so I'm just going to uh, go on to the signs so that then Sharana can take over uh, after that. Um, well, if you, if, there's, if, if you notice changes in their sleep or appetite, um, if there are fluctuations in moods, uh, they'll be quite agitated or anxious. Um, loss of interest in daily routines or pleasurable activities. So if you know somebody who has a routine that either they meet friends or they go for a jog in the morning and they have these routines and they, they actually enjoy, you would see them lose interest and stop doing that. So that's something to pay attention to. Misuse of alcohol and other substances because that becomes an unhealthy coping mechanism when they're going through something. So that's something to look out for. Um, extreme signs of hopelessness and despair. So this actually uh, comes out mostly when people are having a conversation. It would be like, what's the point? Uh, it doesn't matter anyway. So when they talk to you also, there'll be this whole hopelessness that's in their tone of voice. Um, they'll isolate themselves, uh, withdraw. Um, also, there is something called a blunt effect. So basically, if you're hanging out with people that you know, and usually a person would react right? And they would laugh or they would comment and they would have this complete no emotions on their face because they're so caught up with whatever that they're going through. So that's what we call a blunt effect. Um, they might talk about death also and um, they start giving away positions. Uh, it could be things that it, like paying attention if you know a friend who likes collecting stuff or buying stuff and all of a sudden they don't care much for that. Uh, that's something you know to look out for and last but not least is the sudden positive uh, mood that things are better this is important because people if you have noticed if they have been feeling really low for some time and if they have some of these sim symptoms for some time overnight they would be like okay i'm okay let's go out let's party let's meet that can be a very dangerous sign also because most probably then they would have decided as to when they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. So because they have that date planned and set, they feel that, you know, now I have nothing to worry about. So let me just enjoy the rest of the days that I have. People tend to miss that a lot because we always want people to be okay so that we don't have to deal with that, right? So if they've been feeling low and in a slump and all of a sudden they are okay, okay, it's easy. Let's back off now, that person is okay. So that is something we miss a lot. And these are some of the signs that we can pay attention to with people we know, love, care about, even colleagues. Sharon, if you want to add anything.